Good morning and welcome. My name is Taylor Wood and I'm the Associate Dean of Development for the School of Medicine Basic Sciences at Vanderbilt University. I'll be serving as your moderator today. First, I want to thank you for attending. We are thrilled to have you with us today for this exciting presentation on Vanderbilt's research on depression. As you know, October is Depression Awareness Month, and during our glo current global pandemic, this month feels especially poignant. Before I introduce Lisa, one quick item of housekeeping. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Should you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them there. Once we reach the end of the presentation, we'll do our best to provide answers. Now I'm here to introduce Dr. Lisa Montegia. Lisa is the Barlow Family Director of the Vanderbilt Brain Institute and Professor of Pharmacology, Psychiatry, and Psychology at Vanderbilt University. She joined our faculty in 2018 after working previously at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Her work in neuroscience has been at the forefront in understanding the molecular basis of both depression and antidepressant treatment, as well as Rett syndrome. Dr. Montegia is the author of more than 120 chapters in peer-reviewed publications. Her research has been funded continuously since the start of her laboratory by the National Institute of Mental Health. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thank you. So I am honored to be here to participate in this webinar, and I'd like to thank the Alumni Relations Group for inviting me to participate. I'd also like to thank Taylor Wood for that very kind introduction. So I'm gonna be talking to you today a little bit about our work on depression and antidepressant responses. As Taylor mentioned, I'm also the director of the Vanderbilt Brain Institute, Aaron. And I just briefly wanted to give you an idea of what that was, because the Vanderbilt Brain Institute has went through a number of changes over the last few years, uh, especially with my recruitment. And so we are currently over 110 faculty members spread across both VU and VUMC and across 24 different departments. We are the largest graduate program and we are one of the top three largest undergrad programs on campus. So we're really here in terms of studying and focusing on the brain in many different ways. And our goal is to really foster this dynamic intellectual environment. And Vanderbilt's a wonderful place for that because of the collaborative nature, the inclusiveness that's really present on campus. We also want to recruit and retain the very best and brightest scientists. And in the two, right at two years that I've been here, we've already recruited a number of individuals. We recruited a couple of people from Stanford, MIT, a range of places. So we're incredibly excited about this. Um, and also, we're here to build support because in order to really move research forward, it does take support. It's both federal as well as various different organizations and through development. And ultimately we wanna serve society through original research discovery that has clinical implications, which is what I'm gonna hopefully talk to you today about and convince you of some of our work on antidepressant acid. Aaron? So to start with, um, in this webinar, I was trying to figure out how to really introduce the research. And our research, as I mentioned, is really focused on depression and antidepressant efficacy. So what I did is I picked an image from Picasso that was taken during his blue period. And um, this was in the early 1900s. And his blue period was written about because this was brought about by the suicide of an extremely close friend. The friend was in love with a woman, and the love was not returned and the individual killed himself. And Picasso's paintings during this time really took a very dark look. You see these feelings of blue, feelings of melancholy, feelings of sadness. And when you think about it, um, in terms of especially arts, whether it's um, you know, painting or singers or musicians, writers or poets, they often convey their emotion. There's a strong tie-in with emotion and the arts. And you often, as in the case of Picasso, you get this feeling of sadness of what they're trying to convey. Over on the right is uh, another uh, famous painting by Vincent van Gogh, which he painted shortly before he died. And again, you get this sense of sadness that goes into this condition as he suffered from depression. So what is major depressive disorder? Well, it's a very complex disorder and it's characterized by a range of symptoms, including anxiety, Anhedonia, which is the loss of pleasure, the loss of appetite, sleep disturbances, feelings of worthlessness, or inappropriate good. So there's many, many complex traits that go into this disorder. And so therefore, it's very difficult to really try to model this from a preclinical manner. 
And that's really important if you want to advance the field in terms of treatments. And that's where my research has been focused over the last several years. So Erin, the next slide. So we're focused on depression. So we're focused on depression because it's important across society and not only in the US, but across the world. Currently, depression by the World Health Organization is the number one cause of disability in the world and leads to over 1 million suicides annually. And what I have here on the bottom left corner is a graph. And this is the prevalence of major depressive disorder among US adults. And this is in 2018, which is the latest year where there were numbers. And so while the overall estimate is 17.3 million adults in the US, you can actually see that there are some differences that are shown. And so what you can see First of all, is overall, as I said, it's 7.1%, but if you look at how it's broken down by gender, females are at 8.7% compared to males at 5.3%. And these rates are quite consistent year after year. And what's interesting is, as you can tell, females are close to twice as likely to have depression than males. And again, this is stable from year by year, and we also see this across cultures, and it's really unclear why. There's been some thoughts that estrogen, a hor hormone important for females, may make you more susceptible to depression. There's other thoughts that testosterone, which is important for males, may make you resilient to depression, but it's really unclear. But not only is it broken down here, as you can see, by gender, it's also broken down by individuals in terms of age. And what you can see is that the prevalence of adults with major depression is highest among individuals aged 18 to 25. And it then drops at 26 to 49, and then at 50, it's around 4.7%. So as I just mentioned, I pulled this from the NIMH website, and there you'll also find information on suicide. And it's individuals that don't respond to treatment that are most at risk for suicide. And so when you look at these numbers and you hear 17.3 million adults suffer from depression, it's a staggering number. But the individuals that don't recover in terms of antidepressants, again, are the ones most at risk for suicide. And so to put this in some context, in 2008, there were over 36,000 individuals in the US which committed suicide. And if you contrast that 36,000, there were about 16,000 homicides that year. And so while we hear a lot about homicides, because of course it's a devastating situation, there's twice as many suicides. And if you compare that to 2018, if you move forward a decade from 2008 to 2018, the number of suicides went from 36,000 to over 48,000 in that year, just in the US alone. And the suicide rates are continuing to rise in the US worldwide. But thankfully there are treatments and so if you go to the next slide, depression is primarily treated by selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You've probably heard about these because of the commercials on TV. Things like Prozac, Wellbutrin are quite common. But what's interesting is that these drugs typically take several weeks before you start to feel them. So what happens is you take the drug, and again, you have to wait a couple weeks. The problem is, that these treatments are only effective in about 50, maybe 60% of patients. So if you're in that 40 to 50% that don't respond initially, then what happens is they'll probably increase the dosage and you have to wait another couple of weeks. And if that drug doesn't work, then they'll try you on another drug. And again, you have to wait another couple of weeks. And it's this period of the waiting and waiting and waiting where people are, that continue not to respond are most at risk for suicide and individuals that continually do not respond to antidepressants are considered treatment resistant. Now what's interesting is that while these antidepressant treatments have been around for several decades, we know very little about how they produce an antidepressant effect in the brain. We know they work in about half, maybe a little over half of individuals, but why is unclear. Next slide. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is about the basic research, which is focused on a fundamental discovery of how the body works, of how drugs work in this case. And it provides a mechanistic set of information, which is important for treatment advance. 
And I always mention this because whenever people think about, you know, treatment advance, they often think about clinical research. And um, really, you know, what is clinical research? Well, clinical research is taking a drug and putting it into patients and seeing if it responds. And that's important. But you don't want to just take random drugs and put them in people to see if they're going to respond. It's important to first try and identify a target. And I think this is really well highlighted by the example of AIDS. In the 1980s, um, if you heard the word AIDS, you know, it was very scary because it was a death sentence. Um, you know, people were dying. It was unclear what was causing it. I mean, even going to the doctor or dentist were, if you were H a AIDS, if you had AIDS was considered, you know, completely inappropriate. And there were a lot of draconian messages measures taken and put into place because we didn't understand anything about it. And rather quickly through basic research, people identified that the cause of AIDS was actually a virus, HIV. And by understanding that, they quickly were able to develop treatments based on targeting HIV. And now, you know, you can meet someone that's HIV positive that has a very normal quality of life. It really highlights the importance of basic research. And it's this type of approach, which I'm going to talk about in terms of our focus on antidepressant responses, which we think is important to really understand this disorder and to try and have treatment advance, ultimately for individuals that are treatment resistant. And so next slide. So the research I'm going to talk about is really going to focus on identifying the cause of depression and effective new treatments with really more of an emphasis on this new treatment. And we're going to talk about something that until a couple of years ago was completely not understood and the idea of a rapid treatment. Because typically, as I mentioned, antidepressants take several weeks to exert an antidepressant effect. And so if you go to the next slide, on TV commercials, you probably saw something along the lines of this. And they would talk about these are two neurons in your brain. This is how they communicate. And with depression, there's less, and they would say serotonin, because that's how Prozac, Wellbutrin, and these other antidepressants work. There's less serotonin, and if you take the antidepressant, it increases serotonin, and that's it. And while that's true, it's not really true. As I mentioned, we really don't understand how the drug works. The drugs do increase serotonin very, very quickly, but the drugs take weeks to work. And it's been unclear why. So what drug companies have really focused on is trying to make different compounds that target this monoaminergic or this serotonin system, trying to increase serotonin. And there have been some advances on this, but they all take several weeks to work. And the idea, really the dogma has been in the field that an antidepressant response takes several weeks. There's no way to do, do it faster because what you have to do is you have to do structural changes in the brain. It's these structural changes that have to occur that take time. And so therefore, the focus has really been on these types of neurotransmitters and trying to like model them in different ways to make different drugs. The next drug, next slide. And so I put on that slide that this was a paradigm. Now, what is a paradigm? Well, a paradigm is what members of a scientific committee, community share. And if you go to the next slide, what people thought in terms of the paradigm of classical antidepressants or typical antidepressants like Prozac, is that again, these antidepressants have to target the serotonin system, that they're gonna take several weeks to work, that while we don't really understand the mechanism, there's these structural changes that have to happen. And this is where the field has been up until about the last decade, continuing to try and focus on better serotonin drugs, monoaminergic drugs to increase, but again, they're gonna take several weeks to work and they don't seem to have any improved efficacy. Again, even with the best drugs, you're only at about 50 to 60% of patients that they were. Next slide. And this all changed by a rather unexpected finding. So what happened in this uh, set of studies was this was a study that was done on patients where they were actually in, admitted to a hospital and they were primarily suicidal. They hadn't responded to other antidepressants. And what happened was they were trying a drug to see if it would work. And this was a control. This was not expected to work. So they gave a low infusion of a drug called ketamine. And ketamine is a drug that's been around for a long time. Ketamine at very high doses is an anesthetic. 
It's pretty much on any battlefield in the world because it's quite safe. Um, but at a little bit lower levels, it can trigger psychomimetic effects, sort of a psychosis-like behavior. What happened is they administered this drug, IV, an extremely, extremely low dose in patients. And they administered it over 30 minutes. It was, again, supposed to be a control. And what they found rather remarkably was about 70% of the patients had an antidepressant response. And it happened within a couple of hours, which was completely unexpected. And that antidepressant effect lasted for more than a week in most patients with a single dose. So this was really remarkable. It's now been replicated, shown over and over to occur. So this has actually really revolutionized the field of psychiatry. The idea that you actually can have this rapid antidepressant effect. This has also been replicated in individuals with bipolar disorder because they have this period of depression and it's shown to actually help this period of depression without causing an increase in cycling in the bipolar aspect of mania. And it also has implications for suicide. It's been given to patients that present in a psych ER suicidal, and it appears to stabilize them quite quickly. Um, notice, notably, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, has recently approved a derivative of ketamine, um, an enantiomer actually, which is an adjunct treatment for treatment-resistant depression and for adults with major depression and suicide ideation. So there's a lot of interest in ketamine. But again, ketamine could potentially have these side effects if the dose was wrong or, you know, what happens if you give it long term? We don't know because there could be potential side effects. So there's a lot of interest in how ketamine works. So go to the next slide. And so this rapid action of ketamine, which is really remarkable, represents a paradigm shift. And it represents this shift for a couple of reasons. One, it targets the glutamatergic transmission in the brain. It's no longer serotonin. Serotonin is known to take a while to work in many different things, but if you really want to elicit a fast change in your brain, you would target glutamatergic transmission. And in fact, ketamine blocks glutamatergic transmission. And it's rather interesting, it's through this block that you see this rapid antidepressant effect. And the idea that this drug acts within hours, this has been shown clinically. This is work primarily uh, championed by John Crystal at Yale, showing that it acts within hours. Usually the peak antidepressant effect starts within two hours. You start to actually see it within 30 minutes, but it's very rapid. And again, it can have these long-term effects. And the third thing that has been really sort of key to understanding it has been the fact that ketamine elicits a rapid functional change a synaptic plasticity. Plasticity is just a change that alters the function of circuits. It's not structural. You're very quickly having changes on neurotransmission. And it's this third aspect, which has received a lot of attention, which is what our work has been. So our work has really contributed to this change of how you can generate a rapid antidepressant response. And so how do we do this? Next slide. I'm gonna show you a few data slides. So ketamine, has these therapeutic effects, which allows us to examine the mechanism for how it works. And it has these rapid effects. Again, the single dose can trigger a rapid effect with antidepressant effects starting within 30 minutes. So what we're doing is we're gonna do preclinical animal models to first validate that ketamine is producing an antidepressant effect in these animal models. And we know that ketamine blocks glutamatergic transmission, the prolexis NMDA receptors in particular. And that's unlike you know, Prozac or Wellbutrin. So it's quite interesting. So our first question was, is ketamine through blocking NMDA receptors triggering this rapid antidepressant response? And so again, we did animal modeling where we took animals and um, Aaron, can you go ahead and click uh, two more times? Thank you. And so what we did is we did a variety of paradigms and I'm just gonna show you one here. But if you take an animal and you put it in a beaker of water, just a, a round container, which has a certain amount of water at a certain temperature, pretty quickly the animal realizes that it can't escape. And we're talking just a couple of minutes, it's swimming. It can't get out and kind of gives up and it's just floating. But if you give it an FDA approved antidepressant like Prozac or Wellbutrin, it has a certain type of behavior of how it swims that's predictive of an antidepressant response. And so because of it, drug companies use these types of tests 
to try and identify new antidepressants. So what we did is we took and we gave animals different we, drugs. We gave them either ketamine, our drug that produces this rapid antidepressant effect, or two other NMDA receptor antagonists that have a similar profile of ketamine. And we gave them to animals, and we gave them and then tested the animals in this sort of immobility test at 30 minutes or in a different group of animals at three hours, a different group at 24 hours, or a different group at one week. So we weren't retesting the animals because retesting can cause its own confounds. And what we could show is that ketamine, a single dose, produced this decrease in mobility. The animals were increasing their swimming in a certain manner, which is suggestive of an antidepressant effect. And this was happening very quickly. And a single dose was producing an antidepressant effect in these animals for more than a week later, similar to what was seen in patients. These other drugs, which are very similar to ketamine, also could trigger this very rapid increase in antidepressant effects because they had this sort of decrease in immobility. But it was interesting, only ketamine had the long-term effects. And that's something we've been investigating, but we're gonna focus on this rapid effect because this rapid effect really suggests that if you block NMDA receptors, this type of glutamatergic transmission, you can get this rapid antidepressant effect. What was important to note though, is that all these drugs, including ketamine, has a very short half-life. You give the drug and it's cleared from your body within a couple hours. So the fact that you're having these long-term effects is not due to the fact that it's continuing to block glutamatergic transmission. The drug is cleared very quickly. So it really suggests that there has to be something going on in the brain that is triggering these long-term effects. So you block in MGA receptors and then it's triggering some sort of pathway. But what is that pathway? Next slide. So my lab has spent quite a bit of time looking at a molecule called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. And this is a growth factor in the brain that's been shown to be required for typical antidepressants. And so what we did is we took animals that lacked BDNF and we gave them ketamine to see if BDNF was involved with how ketamine was working. And uh, what we're found and what's shown in this is in the blacks are animals knockouts that do not have BDNF in their brain. And then the controls are litter mate controls that do. And so what you can see is that if animal is given just a, a wild type animal is given ketamine, you get this decrease in immobility suggestive of an antidepressant effect. If you just delete BDNF by itself, it has no effect on the behavior but these animals do not respond to ketamine, showing that BDNF is required. And it really shows that, it suggests that BDNF is downstream. You block glutamatergic transmission, and in some way BDNF is involved. It starts to put together a pathway. And this effect is not only necessary 30 minutes, but at 24 hours in a different group of animals. So it suggests BDNF is downstream of glutamatergic transmission, and it's required for these antidepressant effects. We did a lot of work to try and understand what this growth factor is doing and why was it important. And what we could show is that this growth, this growth factor is actually at the point of communication where neurons communicate, it's rapidly increased, which is unusual. And so our data was suggesting that if we block NMDA receptors, these glutamate receptors, you increase this growth factor, it's responsible for an antidepressant effect, and that's fine. But that's not really a mechanism, that's just observation. And it's interesting, but how can we really try to understand what's happening? And really what our effects are suggesting is that glutamate is involved. That again, you're blocking these receptors to increase this protein that are required for the antidepressant effects. And there's a lot of literature that glutamate and these NMDA receptors can increase this growth factor and play important roles in learning a memory and actually have particular functional effects in the brain. So that's well documented. However, all of those studies require activation of these receptors, activation of the glutamate receptors pathway. And ketamine is blocking it. And there's absolutely no precedent for how a drug could block rapid transmission in the brain and trigger any sort of rapid behavioral effect, let alone a long-term effect. 
And we spent a lot of time trying to understanding this, to try to understand this. And really, it, it was very circular at times because it really, again, there's no precedent. How would this work? Next slide. And what we ended up coming up with was actually going in and looking and harnessing some work that came out on um, some work truly looking at functional changes in the brain. And over the last few years, there's been data to suggest that these that um, there is some specificity to what we're seeing. So within your brain, there's two types of neurotransmission. There's a type that's called activity dependent or revoked. And so whenever there's um, action potential, like there's massive changes that are occurring, what happens, glutamate gets released, it binds to these NMDA receptors, and it triggers a pathway. But what's been known for decades is that there's a second form of neurotransmission in your brain, which there's not much known about, and it's called spontaneous transmission. It just happens in the background. We know it's there. Why it's there, again, is really unclear. It's conserved. It's conserved across organisms, but it just, you know, it hasn't received a lot of attention. But over the last decade, there's been some work to suggest that this spontaneous transmission, which is occurring, actually also activates NMDA receptors. And there are different NMDA receptors. I'm not going to get through the specifics of it. But they also can activate NMDA receptors and have a pathway effect. And that there are drugs that specifically target either these NMDA receptors, which have received a lot of attention, but at least through proof of principle, there are drugs that can block these receptors. Now, what they would do is unclear. What we were able to show is that ketamine is blocking these spontaneous NMDA receptors, this pathway that hasn't received a lot of attention. And it blocks these receptors, and it has very specific effects downstream that are not shared by the other form of neurotransmission that's well characterized in your brain. It's distinct. And in particular, it inactivates a certain protein that has been shown to rapidly upregulate BDNF protein as well as other proteins at the point of communication in the brain, which is important for neurotransmission. And we could actually show that if we just go in and block this kinase independent of ketamine, we could trigger a rapid and long-lasting antidepressant effect, and it controls the expression of BDNF. So we start to put together a pathway of how we think ketamine is working. And this by itself um, generated a lot of interest in the field because with typical antidepressants, as I said, we don't know how they work. And taking weeks to exert an antidepressant effect means it's hard to think about a pathway. There hasn't been a pathway proposed. So with ketamine, the fact that it has this rapid effect, and we're seeing selectivity, in particular, with the type of NMDA receptors on glutamatergic transmission, we suddenly were able to then decipher a pathway that appears to trigger the antidepressant effect. And in fact, if we block this, this kinase or we block beating up, we don't see the antidepressant effect. So this pathway is required. Next slide. So the question, go ahead and you can add on the next part of it. The question what we got was, um, you have a pathway, and this is great. You trigger a rapid antidepressant effect, but it doesn't make any sense. Again, because you're blocking this antidepressant, you're blocking these glutamatergic pathway, and you're getting this rapid antidepressant effect, but that doesn't in any way explain how you could have a long-term effect. Again, because blocking glutamate was not known to have these types of effects. So having a rapid antidepressant effect is fine, but how do you get to this long-term effect? And what we did is we did a study, and again, this is behavioral data similar to what I've shown you. And what we did is we took animals, and vehicles just a control, where you get a baseline of how much they're swimming. And again, if you give them ketamine, the drug, you get this decrease, which is suggestive of an antidepressant effect. And what we did is we gave them another drug, which is, has important roles in functional changes in the brain. And just giving this drug by itself, which isn't shown, didn't have any effect. But if you give this drug with ketamine, it blocks ketamine's antidepressant effect. So it suggests that these receptors, if you will, these proteins are involved in ketamine's antidepressant effect. They're also required. And the question is how? I mean, the drug here that blocks these receptors has these functional changes. So how would you look at function? 
Well, how you look at function is that you would take an animal, and we're focusing in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is important for learning and memory, but also seems to be critical for initiating an antidepressant effect, not only with ketamine, but with typical antidepressants as well. With ketamine, what happens is, what's been shown for years is ketamine has been studied, and ketamine has shown not to have any functional changes in the brain in this regard, in terms of these types of plasticities. And in fact, when we did that, we didn't see anything either, which was kind of what people were asking us about. But then we started to think about how we did the experiment. And how you do these types of experiments is you add the drug very shortly for just a couple of minutes, typically two to five minutes, and then you record. You look at functional changes, and there was nothing that happened. But then we started to think, when you give ketamine, you don't get an antidepressant response in two to five minutes, either in animals or in patients. So what we did is typically you infuse ketamine for 30 minutes. So we applied ketamine for 30 minutes to the animals. And when we do that, we get this very nice and very surprising functional change. We actually see this increase. It's called a synaptic potentiation just because it's an increase from baseline activity. And this hasn't been observed before. And it was, again, quite exciting because it suggests that you're engaging a novel form of functional changes. And we went on to characterize this because, again, this has been a really important finding that ketamine can trigger functional changes rapidly in your brain. And so what's causing this? Is this really the pathway that's initiating the antidepressant effect? So if you go to the next slide, again, this is the same data where this is sort of our baseline. If we add ketamine and record in the hippocampus, you get this increase, this potentiation is just shown differently. If we delete this kinase, which is required for the antidepressant effect, it's just downstream of those NMDA receptors, we don't see this potentiation. So if we're interfering with the antidepressant effect in this pathway, we also interfere with this functional change. If you go to the next slide, I shown you that this growth factor was required for the antidepressant effect. That was what sort of started us into investigating pathways. And again, with wild type animals, you see this potentiation with ketamine, but with the BDNF knockouts, you don't. So if you interfere with this potentiation, we don't see this antidepressant effect. And if you go to the next slide, as I mentioned, there's two types of neurotransmission in the brain. And we think ketamine is working specifically on this one type that's not well characterized. And so what we did is we actually took ketamine and we also took a drug that blocks the other form of neurotransmission. And what you can see is that ketamine still produces this potentiation, really suggesting that it is this other spontaneous or not well characterized form of neurotransmission that is triggering the synaptic increase, this increase in function. And if we just block evoked or the other form of plasticity, we don't have any sort of changes that occur. So it appears that it really is selectively targeting these and MDA receptors, this glutamatergic transmission on this not well characterized form of neurotransmission that then elicits this rather surprising increase in function of the brain. And so this was sort of our hypothesis. And what's interesting about a hypothesis is that you can actually test it. I mean, we have drugs that, you know, we have a drug working in clinic, but again, people do have some concerns about the long-term effects, which we don't know yet because the drug hasn't been around long enough to be used as an antidepressant to know. But it allows us to try to dissect out, are we correct? Because this could have a lot of implications if this is the mechanism for how this drug works. If you go to the next slide, what we did is we worked closely in terms of um, building on some other clinical data. So as I mentioned, ketamine blocks NMDA receptors like this glutamatergic transmission. But another drug called memantine also does. It works in a different way on these receptors. It doesn't have exactly the same effect we know, but it's never been closely looked at. We know it can trigger different behavioral effects. And memantine is FDA approved for Alzheimer's disease. It's not very good as an Alzheimer's drug per se, but you don't have the potential side effects you have with ketamine. So what happened in psychiatry was immediately numerous studies, numerous clinical studies, took this drug because it's similar to ketamine in certain ways, and they infused it for 30 minutes in patients. And in some patients, they did infusions for weeks. 
and there was absolutely no antidepressant effect. So how do you have two drugs that both target this channel, this glutamatergic transmission, if you will, broadly, one works and one doesn't? And I'm just gonna show you one slide. What we did is we have proposed this mechanism that you're targeting a particular type of neurotransmission, receptors involved in that form of transmission that then triggers the signaling pathway and this plasticity and the behavior. And so what we did is we actually compared memantine with ketamine to our hypothesis. And if you go to the next slide, this is a busy slide and I just wanna show one thing. This was proof of principle that there were many other aspects of the study, but proof of principle was just reporting one of those little glutamatergic signals, if you will. And when you do that, you can see that just recording one, the ketamine has a functional effect on it. And this is just because it's blocking glutamatergic transmission. That's why there's this decrease, even though in the end it increases overall function. But the mantine, when you look at just one particular channel, doesn't have any effect. And we show this more broadly in many different functional ways. The ketamine and memantine, even though they both impact glutamatergic transmission, when you compare them directly, they're doing it in different ways. And so ketamine, again, by just blocking the single channel, can trigger the signaling cascade and this potentiation that drives the antidepressant effect. Memantine does not block that channel. We also looked, it doesn't trigger any changes in the signaling pathway. It doesn't require this EF2 kinase. It doesn't require beating up. And importantly, it doesn't trigger this potentiation, which we see, which may explain why it doesn't have rapid antidepressant effects. And this study is the only study out there that has attempted to explain why ketamine works and why memantine doesn't. And what's interesting is that there've been a number of drug trials that have occurred where people are trying to make better derivatives of ketamine, if you will, without potential side effects, and they fail. And what's interesting is we've looked at many of those drugs, and there hasn't been any of them that have failed that triggers this pathway, these functional changes, or this plasticity. The next slide. So what we proposed is a testable model for how ketamine can trigger this rapid antidepressant effect. We think that there is a particular signaling pathway that is involved, and we can actually show that if we disrupt this pathway, you don't get the antidepressant effects, and you also don't get this potentiation. So this is a testable model. It also has implication. If you could just particularly target this kinase, independent of the glutamatergic transmission, we can at least show by proof of principle, you can trigger a rapid and long-lasting antidepressant. So we've identified a potential novel drug target that can have rapid antidepressant effects. We also have identified this potentiation. And this potentiation is quite stable. And we only see it with ketamine or with this derivative, which Johnson & Johnson um, has patented, which the FDA has approved for s -ketamine. We don't see it with other drugs. So we think that this potentiation is important and it's quite stable. So you could imagine that you could perhaps set up a drug screen to try and identify drugs that could trigger this type of potentiation, maybe in other ways than these particular receptors and get away, with the side, and get away from the side effects that are seen potentially with ketamine. We've also shown um, the site of where we think this rapid antidepressant effect is initiated in the brain. So it starts to really open up different types of imaging experiments and really starts to point to where you would need to be looking at to initiate responses. And I think rather intriguingly, there's this idea of convergence. And what do I mean by convergence? Well, convergence is that we don't know how typical antidepressants work. We have no idea. They increase serotonin, they do require BDNF, but we don't know how that link between serotonin and BDNF occurs, and eventually you can get an antidepressant effect. Ketamine is clearly working differently because it's targeting this glutamatergic transmission. Interestingly, it does also require BDNF, but you have this very rapid effect. But what we think is that based on the clinical data, that there is probably a point of convergence to trigger an antidepressant effect. And what is that? And what I mean by a point of convergence is this. 
If you take a typical antidepressant like Prozac, it works however it works. You increase serotonin, yes, BDNF is required, and the antidepressants work in, again, about 50 to 60% of patients. But in those individuals where Prozac, well, Butantrin don't work, if you give them ketamine, ketamine works in about 60 to 70% of those patients, not all, but a vast majority of them, the treatment-resistant ones, and you get this rapid antidepressant effect but you still have 20 to 30% that don't respond to either SSRIs or to ketamine. So what we think is, again, if you take a typical antidepressant, it works however it works. If it doesn't work, it may be because you have a particular polymorphism or a mutation in a gene required for that antidepressant response. So therefore, if you give ketamine, it works differently. You're able to bypass it and still get an antidepressant response. But because there's still patients that don't respond to either treatment, those individuals may have some sort of polymorphism or mutation downstream at the point of where those two drugs potentially are triggering an antidepressant effect in very different ways. And so we're very interested in trying to explore this because this could have real implications for individuals that are treatment resistant. Next slide. So where are we at? Well, there's an unmet public health need for faster acting antidepressants with less side effects. And ketamine is important because of this proof of principle. And again, we've tried to dissect out how it works with the hope of developing better therapeutics. And also potentially, could ketamine, we're exploring, could it be a biomarker? Is there some way to perhaps develop a test where you could take blood and know if somebody would respond to ketamine versus the typical SSRI, or such as Prozac. And so the next slide. So what I presented today is really trying to show you the importance of basic research. I started with the example of HIV and AIDS, of really how it set forth treatment options very quickly in terms of individuals with AIDS. And we're hoping because of ketamine, it really is this paradigm shift of rapid effects that it allows us, it's sort of like a Rosetta Stone, if you will, to follow the research to work towards more rapid antidepressant treatments, which ultimately provide hope to individuals, in particular those with treatment resistant and the individuals most at risk for suicide. And then the last slide, and this is just an acknowledgement of some of the people that are responsible for the work. So with that, I'm happy to stop, and I know there's some questions, and go from there. All right, thank you, Lisa. That was a terrific presentation. Very, very interesting research. Uh, we got about 15 minutes here, so we're going to dive into some questions. Um, just so everybody knows, we're going to post a recording of this to YouTube afterwards, so you can send it uh, to friends, family, other people that are interested in this topic. And we may go a little past 12, so to be respectful of your time, uh, you can view the YouTube link and, and see the answers to those to our questions then. Um, so let's start with the, this first one. Um, we know that anxiety and depression are normally present in times of personal crisis and therefore not a part of major depression, but they're still present the threat of suicidal behavior. Um, are there any tests that predict suicide in acute depressions which are not the result of MDD? No, and that's part of the problem. Um, there's been a lot of focus in trying to, under, uh, to try and understand and identify those individuals. And it would help in terms of really treatment regimen if we had a better way of really knowing the path someone was going. There's been a lot of focus in trying to look at um, biomarkers, trying to see, you know, predictively who may be going down a certain path more um, potentially susceptible to depression or in terms of particular treatments. And it's resulted in really taking blood or also imaging studies. But there hasn't been any really clear cut answer on those questions. And I think part of it is because these disorders are quite heterogeneous. And heterogeneous means that they're not uniform. So for example, just in the case of depression, if you had 100 people in a room that were diagnosed with clinical depression, they could present very differently. I gave you the list of symptoms that they could have. They could have a change in sleep. They could have um, changes in anhedonia. They don't all present exactly the same. They can look very different but it's all depression. And so the fact that there's these different types of depression, if you will, thrown in, and you can think about the different types of depression. 
Um, major depressive disorder, which we talked about, is very different than bipolar depression, where you also have mania, which can be very different from, say, postpartum depression. So ultimately, just like with anxiety, there's different types of anxiety, but it's considered anxiety. Depression has different types. Of so that's probably why, for example, in the case of typical antidepressants, they don't work for everyone, because there's obviously probably subtypes that are there as well as genetic vulnerabilities, perhaps particular mutations of why a drug doesn't work. Yeah, to, to build on that, and particularly what you said, um, the last little bit about the genetic um, results of, of, of people, what is your opinion of genetic testing to help determine which SSRI might be most helpful for uh, depression treatment? So there is ongoing research on this. Um, there are certain platforms, some predict that they can uh, predict better than others, but there is nothing that's universal. There is no clear cut answer that I am aware of or most, you know, that if you go in, you will respond to this antidepressant and this should be your course of treatment. This is again, an active area of research. There are different platforms out there where people are trying to get into this personalized medicine aspect. But again, you have a very complex disorder. So they take algorithms to try and predict, but it still is a prediction. I see. So um, to, to shift a little bit, uh, you know, why do you, why do you think the effects of antidepressants are so varied by person? Um, yeah. So the effect of antidepressants may vary because of genetic vulnerability, but also um, what makes one individual depressed, another individual may not be depressed. So we know, again, there's genetic pre predisposition, but you can take two individuals going through the exact same circumstances, and one may develop depression. There is a comorbidity with stress. Not every individual that's stressed suffers from depression, but there is a high comorbidity. And um, another individual going through that same period may be completely fine, and we don't know why. And so because the patient population is so different, the disease is so different often in how it presents, that probably not surprising the treatments can be very different in terms of the responses in individuals. Okay. And then maybe start diving into some of your research on um, ketamine specifically. Could your experiments lead to a new drug or combination of drugs that promotes ketamine's antidepressant effect while avoiding preventing its side effects? So that's what we're hoping. Um, we're doing a number of things to try and look at that. One um, part of this, this plasticity idea, again, has received a lot of attention because this increase in function was very unexpected. So one thing that's unclear is with ketamine, if you take it long term, could you have any of these potential side effects? That's part of the really intense focus in trying to understand mechanism and how it works. So one idea that we're exploring is if you give ketamine and you can trigger this rapid antidepressant response that induces this plasticity, are there other ways, perhaps other drugs, that could maintain it without having to give ketamine again and the potential side effects. We really don't understand the long-term effects and the only way to sustain it now is to give additional ketamine with different dosing down the road. But what happens if you're on ketamine for say a couple years? And you probably will be because if you saw the initial slide of where we broke down by gender, males and females, the largest increase where you see um, really in terms of the diagnosis for depression is individuals 18 to 25. If you're diagnosed with depression, you're probably gonna have it for the majority of your life. There are examples of people that do recover, but in a way, as depression has been called, it's really a disorder of the young. You can be diagnosed at any step, but you probably will have it for years. It's funny because people focus a lot on Alzheimer's disease because it is such a devastating illness. But where it occurs in the time frame, the time that an individual would have it is actually fairly short, where depression has a much longer time. So what does this mean for treatment and taking a drug long term? So we're doing a lot in terms of different drugs, trying to screen for other drugs that could actually trigger this plasticity and have rapid effects. We've actually identified a drug that does have this rapid effect that doesn't trigger the side effects. 
So can we really move forward with this with an I and D um, and really try to see if this is something that could have clinical implications? So we're doing a lot of things trying to really see if we can bypass the side effects of ketamine but still keep the antidepressant effects. Lisa, we're getting a lot of questions about what the side effects of ketamine are. So what, are, what is being presented in, in when they're administering this to the patient? And so when a patient is uh, given ketamine, um, and this has been an academic, uh, primarily has been an academic uh, environment, um, it's been an infusion. And um, there's a lot of these types of research going on clinically, again, in academic settings. The patient, just with the infusion, it's an incredibly low dose. Sometimes they'll say they may not feel great, maybe they feel a little odd, but it's usually while the infusion is going on over the 30 minutes, they're able to talk, they're lucid, they know what's going on, but they may just say, I feel a little off. And once the infusion stops, they seem to be fine. Um, there isn't any sort of long-term effects or anything along those lines. It appears that it is a true antidepressant effect. The problem is, is that if you go slightly higher doses of ketamine, and this is a concern with continual treatment, which we don't know, it's really unclear what happens with long-term treatment. But if you go with slightly higher doses of ketamine, what you can see is you can see learning and memory deficits, you have trouble remembering. And if you go to even higher doses, you can start to trigger psychosis. Ketamine is um, a street drug. It's called Special K because it can trigger the sort of hallucinogenic effects again, at much higher doses. So we're not seeing that in the treatment for depression at all. There's a clear separation because of dose. But the question is, again, if you have the drug for a long time, we, we just haven't known about the drug long-term to know if you give it for decades, what could happen? Right, that makes sense. And you know, that takes me back to something that you were talking about earlier when you said that depression is a diagnosis of the young. When we're looking at that chart that you showed in the very beginning, it, it, you know, the youngest population has the highest percentage. Do you foresee that, that that population, that age range, as they age, will continue to have that percentage? Will it go up? Will it go down? Uh, what, what do you anticipate there? So it's interesting. It tends to, it's been fairly stable. You see this large increase between 18 to 25, and then you start to see it to come back down. Part of it is there's a lot of debate on really between this 18 to 25 year old, um, what is it? What's happening in the brain? Is this really an increase in depression? And it's interesting between this because this 18 to 25 year old group also has a very high risk for suicide. And um, there's a lot of questions about what suicide is and it's really unclear. But one current thought, um, which is interesting, is that if you are an adult, like you or I, and um, you commit suicide, you've been depressed. Um, you talk to your family, to your friends, it's clear that you've been depressed. But between 18 and 25 year olds, while there are individuals clearly that are depressed that commit suicide, there are other individuals that when you talk to family, friends, whatever, they haven't committed, that they haven't been depressed. Hmm. There's actually no evidence. So what's going on in this age group where you have individuals depressed and you have others that aren't? And one thought that's been put out is that dream, you know, and this should be of no surprise to anyone that's been around teens and early adults, is that during this time point, there's a lot of impulsivity. So for example, um, there are numerous examples of individuals within this range which are not been depressed, which have committed suicide. And the question is why if they're not depressed? And often, um, Somebody broke up with them. They didn't get into the college of their choice. And these types of very, what can seem at the time, very traumatic events can trigger this sort of impulsivity. And the question has really been, do they realize they're killing themselves? But it's an immediate response. And so that has been part of what masks that 18 to 25 year old group a little bit, because that also represents sort of the suicide increase as well. I see. So would it be reasonable to conclude, you know, when we're talking about uh, neurotransmitters in these individuals that as age changes, will levels of function change in that neurotransmission or is that held kind of consistent across an age range? So there are differences by age. It's a good question. There are differences by age. Um, 
We don't know. We don't know. One thing about what our data, and we've received a lot of questions on this, and again, it's an interesting idea, but we don't know. We're showing that ketamine is targeting this other, really not very well characterized form of neurotransmission in the brain, which was surprising. So people have argued that, you know, we've been trying to understand what depression is. No one wants to be depressed. Something is happening in your brain. Could there be alterations in this baseline level of neurotransmission in your brain that may make you more susceptible to depression? So that's been one idea that's been thrown out, and we don't know yet. Um, could that change with age? It's possible. Particularly um, changes in the very young and in the very old. And it's interesting because there hasn't been enough research done on the very old in particular, but there has been some anecdotal evidence that individuals um, that have been given ketamine that have been uh, very old, like um, older than 80, may not respond as well. But again, it's anecdotal at this point, but it would suggest that there could be age differences. But again, it would probably be very young and very old. Okay. We're getting right up close to, to uh, 12 p.m. here. So maybe I'll, I'll end with this last question. As the director of the Brain Institute, we, we looked pretty closely, I believe, at some research that's coming directly out of your lab. But the Brain Institute is really a, a trans-institutional institute. I mean, you guys even touch what's happening at VMC as well as many other schools and colleges uh, at Vanderbilt. Maybe could you provide a little bit of what you see as the vision for the Brain Institute tackling these issues of depression and suicide in the future at Vanderbilt? Yeah, and so as I mentioned, um, the Brain Institute is a very large institute here at Vanderbilt. And I hope all of you, when you come to campus, would be willing to stop by, visit us uh, once we are past COVID. The Brain Institute, as I mentioned, it's over 110 faculty spread across campus. We have individuals in both basic departments as well as clinical departments. And what's intriguing is that, for example, the data I showed you today has been done in collaboration with other individuals, for example, Ege Kavalali and others. And so instead of just one particular lab, we're able to reach out and collaborate with people in both multiple departments that really complement the expertise and bring a fresh look different perspective and tools to actually approach the problem, as opposed to maybe a particular department, which only has a particular mission based on who their faculty are. So here, I gave you an example of depression, antidepressant responses, because we're collaborating with people across campus. And the Brain Institute really has tried to facilitate that in various ways with particular disorders. Instead of focusing on a particular department, if, for example, someone's interested in whatever, you know, disease they're interested in, could we actually provide opportunities to collaborate to hopefully move the field forward in a much more aggressive manner than just everybody doing it by themselves? That's fantastic, Lisa. And I, I know I really enjoyed hearing your research and hearing your presentation here. Uh, we have a lot of questions we didn't get to. Um, we'll come through these questions, we'll look at them, we'll see if we can figure out a way to get you guys the answers to those. Um, but really want to thank everybody for attending this webinar today, for participating. Yes, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. And thank you, Taylor, for moderating. No problem. Happy to. Uh, we'll be sending some follow-up information with links um, and some other information on the BBI. But uh, appreciate your all's time today. Um, see ya. Bye-bye.